Bibles and turn with me today to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. In just a few moments, we're going to read verses 9 through 20. As I begin today, let me introduce you to two imaginary men today. The first is on my right side, and we're going to call him the good guy. Let's just call him the good guy. This gentleman is one of the kindest, most caring men that you will ever meet in your entire life. He's loaded with character. He always demonstrates integrity. He's civically civic-minded. He's actively involved in the community, and above that, he attends church every single week. Wow. This is the guy that you want to marry your daughter. He is a really good guy. On this side, the other man that I want to introduce you today is quite the opposite. This is the good guy. This gentleman over here is the bad guy. This guy is is proud and he is self-centered. He's mean dishonest, and he's literally capable of anything. As a matter of fact, this gentleman has been arrested several times and has spent a little bit of time in prison. Not only that, but he's a known drug user. This is the guy that you don't want to be around your daughter. This is a really bad guy. Now, as we think about those two men today, there's a marked difference between them. There's a marked difference between what you and I think about them. One is bad, one is good. One is respected, and the other is feared. One is religious, while the other is rebellious. We would think today that God would look with favor upon this one and with disgust on the other. We would think that this one has earned a trip to heaven while this one has earned a one-way ticket to hell. That's exactly what the Jews of Paul's day thought. And the Jews were guilty themselves of judging people and classifying people and uh, arriving at conclusions, spiritual, judgmental conclusions about individuals' lives. Well, in the first three chapters of Romans, the Apostle Paul refutes that notion. Now now listen, Paul is not saying that that one person is not necessarily uh, better than the other from a human point of view. But the Apostle Paul refutes that notion stating that every person, whether good or bad, whether respected or feared, whether religious or rebellious, catch this today, every person is guilty before God. As our text says today, we all on the inside are bad to the bone. Take your Bibles with me today in Romans chapter 3, and uh, let's say it the way that Paul said it, better the Holy Spirit of God said it in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. Paul says this, well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. If you weren't here last week, we'll review that in just a moment. As the scriptures say, notice what Paul says, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Their talk is foul. 
like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. While they rush to commit murder, destruction and misery always follows them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Verse 19. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Would you pray with me today? Lord, today we look at a serious, serious, yes, yes, a a somber somber passage passage of Scripture. scripture. Father, Father, there are passages of Scripture scripture that seem to strip strip away away all of our self-righteousness, all all of our our goodness, goodness, all of the things things that that we we use use to to, to compare compare ourselves ourselves with with others. And in this passage, passage, you you strip strip it away. away. And you leave leave us naked. naked. As it as were, it were completely, completely exposed, exposed demonstrating, demonstrating how, how we, we really, really are. Father, I Father, pray you'd help, help us to understand the truth, the truth of this passage, passage and even, more, even so, more so. Lord, help, Lord, help us, us to apply it to our, to our lives. lives. Lord, help, Lord, us, help to us to realize how, how desperately we need Jesus. And Lord, I pray, Lord, I pray that, that if there's somebody, somebody here today that, that has depended, depended upon their, their righteousness, righteousness somebody, that's somebody that's depended, depended upon, upon their, their religiosity, religiosity somebody, somebody that is that dependent upon, upon their, their goodness, goodness, I pray this, I pray this morning, morning that they, they would realize, realize we all we would realize, realize that without, without Jesus, Jesus, we're absolutely, we're absolutely nothing. nothing. Without, without Jesus, Jesus, we're bad, we're bad to the bone. To the bone. Thank you for what you're going going to teach us us from this passage passage today. today. In Jesus' Jesus name we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. We started started a series series last last week that we're simply simply calling calling Before before and After. after. We're walking walking through through Romans chapter chapter 3, which which shows shows our life life before we met met Jesus. Jesus. And then we're going to cross the bridge and show Romans chapter 8, which depicts the life of a person after they have come to know Jesus Christ. And we simply, and we simply stated, stated, and you're going to hear us say repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly that, all that all of us, us if we trust Christ, Christ as our personal, personal Savior, Savior, we have, we have a, a before, before and an, an after story. story. Now we've asked, we've asked you, and we're going to continue, continue to, ask to ask you to share, to share your, your story, story with, us. with us. We would love, love to hear how, how God, God is changing, changing your life. And life and you can you share, can your, share story your story with us at before, before and after, and after at ourhcc.org. Our 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 send us send a us short little note. note. Send us send a video. video. Send us send your testimony, testimony what God has done, done in your life. life. I also, also, just by way of announcement, you'll notice, you'll notice each of each our points, points we, have we have a hashtag, a hashtag that says, says before, before and after, and after HCC. HCC. One, of One of the new ways, ways to take notes, notes is through Twitter. And, Twitter. and if God, God speaks, speaks to you during the course, course of, the of the message, message don't, hesitate don't hesitate to, to send, send out a tweet and hashtag it, it so we so together, together can rejoice, can rejoice what, what God is doing in and through our lives. As you read through the book of Romans, you come to the conclusion that the Apostle Paul was brilliant. Paul was well-educated, having studied under Gamaliel, one of the first century's most scholarly minds. But Paul was also extremely articulate. Like an eloquent lawyer, he has the ability to masterfully present his case. That's what the Apostle Paul does in the first three chapters of Romans. Having already presented a powerful testimony as to man's sinfulness, Paul now communicates the ultimate testimony, the testimony of Scripture. And as if the Apostle Paul were standing in a court of law, standing in front of a jury, presenting his case, Paul now imparts the testimony of God's own Word as revealed in the Old Testament. In today's passage, you'll notice, today's passage summarizes the truth that's found in several Old Testament passages. So as we walk through Romans chapter 3, notice a couple of things. The first thing we see is this, and I wrote in my notes, is that the indictment is handed down. 
Verse 9, the passage actually begins with two questions. In the New Living Translation, it's kind of summarized it. But, but in the Greek, there's two uh, questions. What then is the first question? What then? And then the question, are Jews any better than others? Here's the idea. The idea being, what is the point of further testimony? The idea, the Apostle Paul has already powerfully proven that the immoral pagan and the religious Jew are guilty before God. Man's actions condemn him. Our actions condemn us. But that's not enough. The Apostle Paul is not ready to rest his case. As if he needed further evidence to prove his point, the Apostle Paul whips out the Old Testament. And like a surgeon with a scalpel in his hand, he meticulously cuts away any sense of self-righteousness that we may have. And the Apostle Paul lays out a picture, a graphic picture, if you will, of our character who we really are. So if you're following along in your notes, notice the first thing that Paul shows us. Paul shows us, first of all, that man is convicted by his character. First, the apostle Paul goes to Psalm 14, where where David the psalmist gives one of the most honest descriptions of man that is found anywhere in the Bible. And the apostle Paul quotes Psalm 14, In verse 1, which says this, Only fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. So taking that truth and applying it to his argument, the Apostle Paul says it this way. He says, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one is righteous. The first thing that the Apostle Paul says then about man's character is this. Paul says that man is morally depraved. There's two words that I want us to focus on for a moment. One is biblical and the other word is theological. The first word is the word righteous. Paul says no one is righteous, not even one. The word righteous is found some 240 times in the Bible. The basic meaning is this, being right with God. So here's what Paul says, on our own, apart from Jesus, no one is right with God. No one is righteous. The other word that I use is a word that, that's a theological term which describes this passage is the word depraved or the word depravity. And the idea is this, man is naturally inclined towards doing evil. Man, if you're a parent, you know this. Did you have to teach your kids how to do wrong? Did you have to teach your kids how to lie? Did you have to che- uh, teach your kids how to cheat? Did you have to teach your kids sit down and say, okay, now listen, I want to teach you how to be disobedient so I can punish you later, all right? I mean, none of us have to do that. Why? Why, there is a, there, there is a, 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 a natural inclination to sin. There's a natural inclination to do wrong. And this word depravity not only expresses an inclination to do evil, but it also expresses an inability to do good. Both of those truths, not being righteous and depravity, are expressed in verse 10. And Paul says it this way in very simple terms. Paul says, there is no one that is righteous, not even one person. If you speak Spanish, I love the the, uh, emphaticness of the Spanish language because it says this, ni siquiera uno, not even one. That's the idea that Paul is conveying in the passage. Now, as you read that and you hear Brian talk today, you might sit back and say, hold on, wait just a second, Brian. How can you say that no one is good? You'd say, Brian, what 
What about the philanthropist that, that, that donates large sums of money to needy people? Isn't that a good person? Brian, what about the firefighter that gives his life saving somebody else? Isn't he a good person? What about the school teacher that dedicates her time and her own resources to teach her kids? Isn't she intrinsically good? Isn't God pleased with what they do? How can Paul say there's nobody righteous, not even one, and look at all these people in our community that do good stuff? Brian, that doesn't make sense. Let me quote you a verse from the Old Testament that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Isaiah says this, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Isaiah says that the very best things that we do in the sight of God are nothing more than filthy rags. Let me illustrate that this morning. I have two shirts here today. I have a, uh, a white t-shirt. This is actually brand new. I've only wore this one time. and So uh, nothing stained on it, no ketchup stains, no mustard stains, no pizza stains on this one, uh, um, no sweat stains under the arms. I mean, this is, this, is, this is pretty clean right here. And then this is another shirt. This is actually, this is the shirt that I, that I polish my shoes with. And so every single week when I polish my shoes, I've used it for years. Now, some of our Yankee fans are going to like this because it's an old Cleveland Indian shirt. And so uh, uh, if you don't like the Cleveland Indians, you can say, Brian, that's the best use for that shirt you possibly can give. And so probably for the last 10 years, this is what I used to polish my shoes. I could go out maybe and get a brush or I could go out and get an expensive kit. But why do that when I have this shirt, all right? Now, now, which shirt would you say is clean today, and which shirt would you say is dirty? No brainer, right? The clean one and the dirty one. Now, try to understand, and, and the language that Isaiah uses in Isaiah 64 and verse 6 is very graphic, and I'm not going to even use the graphic terms that Isaiah uses, but Isaiah is saying that the good things that we do, donating money to help others, saving people's lives, giving and dedicating our time to educate kids, to help others, all of those good deeds are not like a white t-shirt in God's eyes. All of those things in God's eyes are just like dirty, filthy rags. Here's the idea, and, that, and that's certainly not taking away from anything good and kind and nice that you do. As believers, our lives should be characterized by good deeds and nice deeds and all of those things. But the idea is, in God's eyes, in God's economy, there is absolutely nothing that you and I can do that God would walk away and say, wow, that was good. Wow, that was a righteous act. Wow, I am impressed. Whether you realize it or not, Jesus in heaven has never stood and given you a standing ovation for anything that you did in your life. Why is that? Because there is no one that's righteous. No, not one. The Apostle Paul says, we are all morally depraved. We cannot please God on our own. He says a second thing. Let me show you in the passage. He says, secondly, that we are biblically ignorant. Notice in verse 11, he says it this way. No one is truly wise. Once again, the apostle Paul pulls his thoughts from Psalm 14. This time he's quotes Psalm 14 in verse 2 that says this. The Lord looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise. If anyone seeks after God. Here's what Paul is saying. No one has um, the innate ability to fully comprehend God's truth or to fully comprehend God's righteousness. Why is that? 
Notice what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18, describing man, describing us. He says this, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life of God or from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. No one is intelligent enough. No one is smart enough. No one is wise enough. All of us are spiritually and biblically ignorant. He says a third thing in the passage. The third thing he says is this, that man is naturally rebellious. Notice the latter part of verse 11. He says this, no one is seeking after God. Now, now I want you to notice the emphatic terms that the apostle Paul is using. Paul is, Paul is not saying hardly anyone or there's a small group of believers that, that meet together on the corner of 441 and Taft. They are, but nobody else is. What does he say? No one is seeking after God. If I asked you today, what does the phrase no one mean? It means nobody. Nadie. Nobody is seeking after God. Now, judging from the vast religions of the world with millions of followers, one might argue that many people are diligently seeking after God, but the Scripture makes it clear that they might be looking for something, but in and of themselves, they're not looking for God. You see, we don't have the ability in and of ourselves to look for God on our own. Jesus said it this way in John 6, For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. No one naturally looks for God on their own. It is God who begins the process. Our looking for Him is in response to Him looking for us. Aren't you glad that God started looking for you. John said it this way, we love him, why? Because he first loved us. We look for him because he first looked for us. We respond to him because he first of all responded to us. Man is naturally rebellious. But, but Paul makes a fourth statement that is even more dramatic he says man is spiritually worthless. Notice verse 12. He says this, All have turned away. All have become, and he uses this word, all have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. The word that is used in Psalm 14 has the idea of something that is corrupt, something that is worthless, something that has no value whatsoever. It has no value, and as a result, it must be discarded. It is a word that would be used for rubbish, for garbage, for something that is completely despised, rejected, and disposable. Paul says this, man is utterly useless. And so as we read those, past, those verses, you say, man, Brian, man, you are painting a pretty bleak picture I mean, man is morally depraved. He's biblically ignorant. He's naturally rebellious. He is spiritually worthless. But Brian, isn't there anything good that we offer to God? Let me, let me illustrate it this way today. Let me try to see if we can understand this. Let's, let's suppose that this week we hold a Monopoly tournament at Hollywood Community Church. How many of you are Monopoly fans? All right, so we'd have a good number. We hold a Monopoly tournament, and, and the goal at the end of the week is that we are going to crown the Hollywood Community Church Monopoly champion. All right, so we hold a Monopoly tournament, and, and, and you get in, and, and you start winning Monopoly games, and, and when you win the game, the prize is we give you all of the Monopoly money and that game. If you haven't counted, there's $15,140 in every Monopoly game, and so you win the first game, and we say, congratulations, you get to keep all of the Monopoly money, and you walk away with $15,140 in Monopoly money, and you go to the next 
next round, and you win the next game, and you win $15,140 of Monopoly money, and you keep winning, and you keep winning until you become the Monopoly champion at Hollywood Community Church. You win 10 games, and you walk away with 151400 Monopoly dollars. You're the champion. Exciting, isn't it? I'm telling you. So the next day you wake up, you take all of your Monopoly money, and you walk into Wells Fargo Bank down here. <laughs> and you walk in and say, I'm here to make a deposit. How much money you want to put in? Somewhere in the neighborhood of $150,000. And the lady says, wow, that's pretty good. And you say, yeah, I'm the Monopoly champion at Hollywood Community Church. And these are my winnings. And, and with a sense of pride, you slide the envelope across the counter. And the lady takes it, opens up the envelope, and sees $151,400 in Monopoly money. How is she going to respond? She's probably going to call security and have you kicked out of there because she's going to think that you're halfway crazy. And you might say, hold on a second, listen, I'm the Monopoly champion. Nobody at Hollywood Community Church plays Monopoly like I do. That's what I won, $151,400. And she's going to look at you as if you didn't know and say, there is a difference between real money and Monopoly money. Monopoly money is not real. Church, when we stand before God, it's easy for us to say, God, man, I'm a champion. I've done this right, and I've done this right, and God, I've done all of these works, and we slide, as it were, our good works underneath the window to an almighty God wanting to make a deposit of our works, proud of what we've accomplished. God, here is my righteousness. And God looks at us and says, your righteousness is not real righteousness. It's not the same thing. We're talking about two different things. We're talking about monopoly money and real money. That's why the writer of Isaiah can say, all of our righteousness, all of our good deeds, as good as we think they are in the sight of God, they're just like filthy rags. And the Apostle Paul says, man is convicted. We are convicted by our character. As we walk through the passage, Paul is not done. Paul says, secondly, that man is convicted by his conversation. In verses 13 and 14, we see that those verses are made up of three quotations from the Old Testament. He uses Psalms 5, 9, Psalms 140 and verse 3, and Psalm 10 and verse 7. And what is striking about that is that all of them refer to the organs of speech, throat, tongue, lips, and mouth. In the previous verses, we learned how people harm themselves by turning away from God. Here we learn how they harm others by the organs of speech that God has given them. All of us are familiar with the, with the childlike phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You know as well as I do, that's not true. That's not true. I've... Uh, I've fallen in life and broken bones and hurt myself. I, I don't remember, I remember doing those things, but I don't remember the pain that I experienced with those things. But I remember very poignantly the pain that I have felt when people have hurled unkind words at me. Words hurt. They affect us deeply. Here in the passage, Paul says two things about our words, the words of the person that doesn't know Jesus. He said, first of all, his words are defiled. Notice how the psalmist describes man's conversation in verse 13. He says, their talk is foul, like the stench of an open grave 
is what the verse says. Here's the idea. When you bury a dead body, you don't leave the grave open. That would be unheard of. You wouldn't leave the the tomb uncovered, the grave open. Why not? Because it won't take long and the body will begin to smell and smell badly. Here's what Paul says, what the grave is to a corpse, the throat is to man's heart. The idea is this, what, what, what a person's character is eventually will manifest itself in their conversation. The words come out of our hearts. Verse 14, Paul says it this way, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Man's words are defiled. He says the second thing, man's words are deceitful. Notice in verse 13, he says their tongues are are filled with lies. The word for lies has the idea of alluring, and it was used of of baiting a hook by by covering a, a hook with a small piece of food to disguise the danger. When, when the fish bites the food, thinking he will get a meal, he becomes what? He becomes the meal of the fisherman. Why? He's been lured. He has been deceived. That's the word that is used in the passage. The tense of the verb indicates continual, repetitive deceit. You see, for the natural man, lying and other forms of deceit are habitual and normal parts of of his or her life. So let me pause for just a second. And I'm hoping that these verses are not describing you this morning because I trust that you already have a relationship with Jesus and he is changing your life. But this morning, how about you? Are you a truthful person? Do do lies come out of your mouth? Is your mouth an open grave that quite frankly stinks? And it's filled with stench, with defiling words. I trust not. Man is convicted by his conversation. The third thing that we see in the passage is this. Man is convicted by his conduct. Uh, The Apostle Paul quotes Isaiah 59, verses 7 and 8, to describe the action of violent men. And in order to see the progression, let's take them in, in reverse order. Notice verse 17. He says this, They don't know where to find peace. The person that does not know God is peaceless. They they do not know, they do not understand personal peace. Isaiah said it this way in Isaiah 57, 20 and 21. But those who still reject me are like the restless sea, which is never still, but continually churns up mud and dirt. There is no peace for the wicked, says my God. The life of the person who does not know the Lord is peaceless. The life of the person that does not know the Lord is a life filled with disaster. It's disastrous. Notice verse 16. Destruction and misery always follow them. Such a graphic picture of destruction and misery are seen in the daily lives of so many people. You come across it. Broken marriages. Abused children. Estranged relationships unhappiness, despair. That describes many people in our world today. Describes people who do not know the Lord. The last thing he says is he goes along the progression going backward. He says that such a person is murderous. Verse 15, they rush to commit murder. The New King James says it this way, their feet are swift to shed blood. Working backward, we come to the last of these descriptive actions. Their end, Paul says, is death. Man left to himself will not prosper. He eventually destroys himself. You said, Brian, prove it today. Look at all of the empires that have been established by men throughout history. The Mayan Empire. If you've never traveled throughout Latin America, you ought to see the magnificence of the Mayan Empire. But the Mayan Empire no longer exists. The Roman Empire, as magnificent as it was, the Roman Empire no longer exists. Go to Turkey and see the remnants of the Byzantine Empire. It no longer exists. Why? Man left to himself 
will not prosper. Man left to himself will destroy himself. He says a fourth thing in the passage. Man is convicted by his callousness. Verse 18 says this. They have no fear of God at all. The last phrase comes from Psalm 36 and verse 1. And it's an apt conclusion to this discouraging description. There is the callousness on the part of man feeling like he is okay without God. You know, you might be here today and you might think that. You might say, Brian, oh, okay, Brian, this, uh, this religion stuff is good for a lot of people, but Brian, I can make it on my own. God, I really, I don't, or, or Brian, I, I really don't think I, I need God, at least not now in my life. I'm okay on my own. There is a callousness on your part, a failure to realize how desperately you need God. They have no fear of God. The word fear in the text does not mean what we usually mean by the word fear. It doesn't mean fright or terror, but in the Bible it means a right, reverential frame of mind before God. We put God in his rightful place. Psalm 9, our Proverbs 9.10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Yet we callously live as if God does not exist. If I told you that our nation was filled with atheists, you might respond negatively to that. But our nation is filled with millions of people who possibly profess that God exists, but they live as if he didn't or doesn't. No communication, no obedience, no submission. There is a callousness towards the things of God. They don't thank Him. They don't obey Him. They don't communicate with Him. And they don't trust Him. They're convicted by their own callousness. We, we're almost done. We come to the end of the chapter. And we see not only that the indictment is handed down, but we see that there is a guilty verdict that is declared. As the Apostle Paul, as it were, were in a courtroom, and the Apostle Paul rests his case, there's a hush in the courtroom. The defendants, that's, that's us, that's, that's man, stand before the supreme judge of the universe, waiting for his verdict. <laughs> what, what will the judge say about you? What will the judge say about me? Will he look back all, or, or will he look by all the evidence that the Apostle Paul has presented? Will he overlook that? But the judgment comes quick and clear. In verse 19, Paul says it this way, the entire world is guilty. Verse 19, notice it with me. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given for its purposes to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. The decision allows for no exceptions. There is no partiality. Even God's own people stand accused and condemned. The entire world is guilty. Paul says it this way farther along in the chapter in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. The word all means absolutely everyone. Now Paul, anticipating the argument, goes through and says, Wait a second, because he knows what they might say. But, but, but Paul, man, we are trying to keep the Old Testament law. We're trying to be as good as we possibly can. Paul says, no, you need to understand that the Old Testament law is powerless. Obeying the law has no power to save. It only demonstrates our weakness. It only shows how sinful we really are. It shows all of our faults, all of our weaknesses, all of our blemishes. It shows the way that we really look. As we read that, past, that, that passage today, you might sit back and say, man, Brian, that is a very discouraging passage. 
It sounds as if there's no hope. It sounds as if all of us are condemned. And we are. But as you stand in the courtroom before God, the judgment has already come down. We are all guilty before God. And the judge quickly speaks. The judge says what normally does not happen because the judge usually takes time to pronounce his sentence. And and yet now, at the moment, the supreme judge of the universe is ready to pronounce his sentence on each and every one of us. What will be our punishment? And yet before he does that, notice verses 21 and 22. I want us to end with this today. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. Verse 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Would you read that with me today? Let's read that together. Would you read that? We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Let's read that much again, one more time. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Catch what Paul says. Paul says, listen, every single one of us, from the good guy to the bad guy, from the guy that you want your daughter to marry to the guy that you want your daughter to stay so far away from, it's unbelievable. All of us, whether religious or rebellious, all of us are guilty before God. And all of us stand condemned. God comes in at the last moment and says, man, you're guilty, but there's a way. There's a way. There's an escape. And it's not by doing good, because you can't be good enough. The escape is this, by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. So the question this morning, church, is this. The question is not, how good are you? And You might be able to pull out a whole list of accolades, but you're not good enough. And neither am I. Your goodness condemns you. And my goodness condemns me. The only hope is Jesus. That is the only hope. And next week we're going to look at the latter part of Romans chapter 3 where the Apostle Paul goes through and he explains not only what Jesus did, but he explains in the mind of God how that the work of Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins, allowing those of us who are guilty to go free. So much so that when we get to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul says this, there is no condemnation, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So this morning, I stand before a guilty audience. And you're looking at a guilty pastor. Now, I used to be guilty. That was my before story. There was a time in my life when I realized that I was a sinner. And I realized that I could never, ever do it on my own. I was a wicked, mean-spirited, six-year-old boy. And I realized I needed Jesus Christ. And I gave my life to Jesus. And what I was is no longer what I am. And what defined me no longer defines me. And even though I was bad to the bone, Jesus came in my life, came in my life and changed me. The question this morning is not how good you are. The question is not even how bad you are. The question is this. Do you know Jesus? Have you repented of your sins and given your life to Christ? See, you can be the most religious person in the auditorium today, but if you don't know Jesus, 
you're bad to the bone. You can be the most civic-minded person in the city of Hollywood, but if you don't know Jesus, you're bad to the bone. Why, you could have given your time and your talents, even your own life for someone else, but if you don't know Jesus, you're playing with monopoly money, and it's not worth anything. And God says, let me give you my righteousness. Let me give you the real thing, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is only received by faith. I trust that you know him today. Would you stand with me this morning with your eyes closed and your head bowed as Bernita and James come? We're going to sing just a simple invitation this morning. You know, as a pastor, as a pastor, one of the burdens of my heart is that I realize that there are church members, church attenders that have never truly repented of their sins and never turned to Jesus. They're depending on their goodness. They're depending upon all the great things that they do. And they fail to realize that they can't do enough. They'll never be good enough. They need Jesus. Have you come to a place in your life where you realize that? Have you come to a place in your life where you realize there's nothing good in me, there is nothing righteous, there is nothing that pleases God, I am depraved, I need Jesus. If you've never come to that place in your life, man, I beg you, I beg you to realize that today. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you and will you in humble submission and forgiveness or with a repentant heart ask God to forgive you and ask Jesus to come into your heart and be your personal Savior. Paul says you're condemned, but there is a way. The way is Jesus. Do you know him? Right where you're standing today, you can pray a simple prayer like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. And by faith, I believe what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me. And I confess I give my sins to you. And I take your righteousness. Change me. Save me. Give me a before and after story. Change my life. If you're here today and you'd love for us to pray with you, we have counselors down front that would love to take the word of God and pray with you today. Maybe there's something else that the Holy Spirit of God is speaking with you about today. The altar is open. You be sensitive as we worship the Lord together as we conclude the service. You come.